Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, the hour of victory has arrived. The boast this morning of the Iraqi Prime Minister as government and Kurdish forces launch their major push into the city of Mosul. Islamic State militants have controlled Iraq's second city since 2014 and will not be easily dislodged. But today's offensive does look as if it may be the beginning of the end of IS occupation. At what cost, though? There are believed to be 600,000 residents trapped in the city itself and 1.5 million in the wider Mosul area. Our chief correspondent, Alex Thompson, has this report. After the weeks of build-up, the hours of darkness before the off. For a battle, they will assuredly win. Kurdish Peshmerga fighting alongside the Iraqi army for the first time. Before dawn, Iraq's prime minister, flanked by the brass, announced the waiting is over. By first light, units were already advancing. But this is the easy bit. Small villages, overwhelming odds, open ground. Today is a historic day. Today is a turning point in the war against terrorism. For a long time, we have been working on making the plans among the military commanders from the Iraqi army and the Peshmerga forces to defeat Islamic State. He said all land taken by his forces will remain part of Kurdistan. They'll be listening to that in Baghdad and Washington. But for now, the battle. Yet the day was not without resistance. What's thought to be a suicide truck races towards forward tanks at a village east of Mosul. The Islamic State said it mounted 12 such operations today. Roughly 30,000 Iraqi and Kurdish Peshmerga troops, along with assorted Shia and Sunni militias, have almost completely surrounded Mosul. But the main push for Mosul will come from tens of thousands of Iraqi army, along with Shia militias, moving in from the south. It's thought some kind of escape route west to Syria and the Islamic State heartland will be left open to draw the fight out of populated areas into open ground. The Iraqi army, who infamously legged it in terror when Islamic State showed up in Mosul, is now more of a force after evicting it from Iraqi cities like Ramadi and Fallujah. Our morale is high. God willing, we will achieve complete victory over Islamic State and the enemies of Iraq, whether that's IS or Turkey. Those who challenge Iraq will have no one to blame but themselves. Even so, they need these people. French special forces and alongside them, British, American and Australian counterparts all involved. Overhead, coalition jets are bombing, including the RAF, attempting to find something to hit. But locating targets in a city of 600,000 non-combatants is difficult. Mistakes and civilian bloodshed are guaranteed. This operation to regain control of Iraq's second largest city will likely continue for weeks, possibly longer. Leaflets have been dropped over Mosul, telling the trapped population to stay indoors for at least some safety. But how to dislodge Islamic State and avoid killing civilians? Mosul could so easily become a mirror image of Aleppo over the border. Conventional armies trying to dislodge militias from densely populated cities with bloody consequences. In the city itself, graffiti supporting resistance to IS but the penalty for anyone caught is, of course, death. And recent days have seen a rash of executions. Large camps are in place for some of Mosul's refugees and thousands have already fled. But charities warn nothing like enough is there should hundreds of thousands seek shelter.
So the battle is underway and victory is certain. But then comes the real struggle. The Iraqi army, the Kurdish Peshmerga, brothers in arms for now with a common enemy. But how will the spoils of war be carved up in and around Mosul when that time comes? Alex Thompson. Well, earlier I spoke to Adel al Jubair, the foreign minister of Saudi Arabia, one of the key powers in the region. They're backing rebels in Syria, but also fighting a war in Yemen, where they're facing increasingly strident criticism. I began, though, by asking him whether ISIS was now losing the war. ISIS uh, will lose this war. There's no doubt about it. The uh, international coalition has the resources, it has the men, it has the money, it has the technology, it has the will. At the end of the day, this is a contest that ISIS will not, cannot win, period. It's a matter of time. But uh, Sunni extremism can morph into another shape, can't it, and re-emerge as another organization. Just as ISIS came out of Al-Qaeda, something else might come out of ISIS. And the, the, the problem that creates Sunni extremism has not gone away. We are doing everything we can to fight extremism. I don't believe there is any country in the world that is more committed or more determined or has expended more resources and more effort to do this than the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. We, we cannot allow people to hijack our faith. We cannot allow people to take a peaceful religion, all religions are peaceful, and turn it into a way to justify violence. At the end of the day, Saudi Arabia is at the crosshairs of these extremist organizations because Saudi Arabia is the birthplace of Islam and home of the two holy mosques. Okay, let's talk about Yemen. Um, the appalling tragedy, the bombing of the funeral, 140 dead, 500 people injured. Um, you've now apologized, haven't you? We have, uh, we've looked into it. Investigation is still ongoing. The preliminary results show that there was a faulty intelligence that there was a, a disregard of the uh, protocols and procedures for taking strikes, that uh, <clears throat> the problem was with the high command in Yemen um, and with the command center That's in Yemen. That's a terrible mistake to make, isn't it's it? I mean, these are procedural problems absolutely. that have resulted in 140 innocent civilians getting yes, killed. It's a terrible tragedy. Whoever is responsible for the death of 140 people must be held accountable. There is no but, if, where, or what. By apologizing, you've kind of led the way on this. Do you now want, or would you expect that British companies, if they supplied weapons that were used in this attack, should also apologize? No. Why not? Because we're the client and we're the customer. We purchased the equipment from Britain, and the equipment was used in a legitimate war in accord with international humanitarian law. Uh, a, a, a terrible mistake happened and the mistake is being investigated, and we will make amends. I take it then that this is confirmation that British weapons were used in this particular attack? I can't confirm what the weapons are that were used, but it's part of the investigation It will come out. But I mean, it's either British or American weapons, isn't it? That's, that's, that's mainly what you're dealing with Whatever here. the weapons are that are being used in Yemen, they are used in accordance with international humanitarian law in a legitimate war of self-defense, in a legitimate war to defend the legitimate government of Yemen. This is not an illegal war. You've been engaged now, the coalition has been engaged in Yemen for 18 months, and you still haven't defeated the Houthi rebels, who are much less well armed. I mean, that shows you the limitations of your military power, doesn't it? I don't think so. ISIS in Syria and Iraq, a coalition of more than 60 countries, including the world's great powers, the US, Britain, France, Germany, Australia, more than 60 countries have been waging a war against ISIS in Syria for the last two years. And they have not, and ISIS still controls 37% of Syria. So this is about the limitations of military power in that part of the world. And you're discovering a lesson that the Americans learned to their own cost in Iraq and to some extent in Syria. I, I think that uh, the operations in, in, uh, against the Houthis in Yemen have been fairly successful. Uh, most of the country now is no longer under the control of the Houthis. The uh, government forces are, are gaining momentum. Uh, many of the large cities in Yemen have been liberated from the Houthis. So we see progress. It's not stagnant. But we hope, we hope that this matter can be resolved at the negotiating table, not on the battlefield. Well, to discuss Iraq, I'm now joined from Erbil in northern Iraq by the head of the International Rescue Committee in the country, Alexander Militinovich. Mr. Militinovich, what are your concerns for civilians in Mosul at the moment? 
Well, we are very concerned about the plight of civilians and the civilian population of the Mosul city. With no escape routes, with no safe routes, people are really risking their life to be caught in crossfire, and they're risking their lives uh, to be leaving the city at this dangerous moment. Now, we understand up to 1.5 million people may be affected. That's the UN's estimate. Are you expecting a sort of mass exodus of people trying to leave the city? We expect in the first week of fighting to, uh, around 200,000 people to leave the city, and we expect this to be one of the worst man-made humanitarian crises in the recent years, where up to 1 million people will be affected and 700,000 will be in need of uh, humanitarian assistance. Well, have preparations been made then for these people who are going to be displaced? We are rushing against the time. We are doing the best we can as the International Rescue Committee and as a humanitarian community to provide for these people. We have prepared uh, cash, blankets and uh, assistance for 60,000 people. And if we receive additional support, financial support, we would be able to respond to 90,000 people in the uh, few weeks of the operation. So the situation is very dire and we need all the support and assistance we can get. Would you like to see the creation of safe corridors? And if so, who should be responsible for that? The safe corridors are a very tricky question right now because those corridors, once announced, can be used to, to attack civilians. So we are calling on all sides of the conflict to actually respect and protect civilians. And we are, want to ensure that they are safe and they can reach safety as soon as possible. But the safe corridor at this moment are something very concerning. And we are really concerned that if they are announced, they might be attacked. Civilians might be attacked. And as you say there, there is the concern that civilians may be used as human shields. What can be done to mitigate that? We are doing everything we can. We are trying to ensure that the civilians reach safety as soon as possible. We are hearing the stories that ISIS might be pushing around 200,000 people and expelling them towards military in order to slow down their campaign. So if this thing happens, we are going to be facing a very big humanitarian crisis and potential for a lot of civilians to be hurt. So we are working with all sides and we are trying to ensure that we can protect civilians and that we can bring them and provide assistance as soon as they reach safety and get out of the front line. Alexander Militinovich, thank you very much.